lot of that day is blur to me. As soon as I saw the first tower hit, I ran to the telephone and I called him at the office, but there was no answer. I just had this feeling looking at her that she knew he was gone. I had that same feeling. I don't know why. I still was thinking he'll surface somewhere. We know what it's like to lose someone in, in, under a horrible circumstance. Coming from London, where there's been rampant terrorism all our lives, uh, we expected we were leaving it behind. Look at his death certificate, which was a real shock to me, looking at it and seeing cause of death, homicide. I learned a little bit about quilting, but it was an experience. I wanted to do something extra in Peter's memory. He died on September 11th. As I walked home to Brooklyn that day, I smelled the smoke and thought about all the people who would not return home. I wanted to help. What could I do? In the days that followed, I learned about an American quilt, a project inspired by the AIDS quilt of 1987. Families and friends created quilt panels for those we lost on September 11th. People felt compelled to respond to the September 11th attacks. Quilting emerged remarkably quickly as sort of form of expression that people felt was appropriate. What's fascinating is less the seasoned quilt makers. It's the number of people who had never before quilted, airline pilots, accountants, all manner of people, who somehow felt driven to do this very tactile, intimate art form. I wasn't sure how I could contribute, so I met with quilting volunteers. But I'm a filmmaker and I don't sew. I mean, this has nice ways. When I learned that many families wanted to share their stories, I set out with my camera to meet them. These families were still suffering deeply. Would creating a quilt panel help them heal? Sandy. When I first met Sandra, both of us had divorces, and I think marriage would have been our last words that we couldn't even get out. And for her and I to come to that point was very special. It was like a, a, my best friend and partner more than anything else. She and I grew up together. My dad and her split when I was about six years old. So it was just her and I in, in like a little one-bedroom apartment. She, you know, started with very, very little, almost nothing, and managed to um, make a nice life for herself. She's very proud of that. He did not work at the World Trade Center. He was there that day just for a meeting at 8.30 uh, on the 105th floor. He was an engineer. He worked for an insurance company. It was my youngest child's first day of nursery school. So as he was entering the building, he called to wish her good luck. 
He was in tears the night before because he wanted to be there. I made this panel for my son, Vincent, who was 25. He was my oldest. Vincent lived a very full life in the 25 years. Vincent was really into computers. He loved computers since he was a little one. We had a computer very early. He was excellent with them. My son was a co-pilot of Flight 93. He wanted to be a pilot since he was two years old. On weekends, we used to take him to the neighborhood airports. The other children were tired of it because we remained for such a long time. Leroy would say, Daddy, can I watch a plane one more time? Take off. Can I watch it one more time, Lind? Whenever he saw anything about planes in a newspaper, he would clip it out and would save it. He started when he was about nine years old, and he continued until he went to the Air Force Academy. The whole book is full with different planes. The wonderful panel was made by some very dear friends of ours for my husband, Clive Thompson, known as Ian. He was an international money broker. He'd worked for Eurobrokers London. He joined it back in 1979. He was a real people person. People interested him in every shape and form. He loved helping others. He really enjoyed working on the Summit Volunteer First Aid Squad. He was a part of this wonderful Friday night crew. programmer. He was very talented in the computer field and that's why he was where um, where he was on September 11th working on the 96th floor in Tower One. He liked to be the center stage. He liked bright colors. He always wore these loud stripes, oranges, yellows, reds, greens in odd combinations and as being a programmer it seems that he got away with that. He was also a very caring, strong family person. This is just for you, Peter. For some people, creating art is an expression of the loss, and in that sense, the reworking has a healing component to it. But it's also something that remains. It has a permanence to it something that is a reminder of what you've processed and lost. It remains forever. It feels like something to hold on to. This is a good one right here. This is a real gold. No, I don't know. You don't like that one. Do you like this I one? Know, I like the yellow. You said we could use yellow. My husband comes from Yugoslavia. I come from Switzerland, so actually Peter was a first-generation American. But I want to frame the whole thing, not just let the, the stripes uh, right. hang out there. Right. And these stripes are going to go in the opposite direction right. to really clash. <laughs> That's actually a, a fabric from the 50s that is a, it's a seersucker. Then I need black. Do you have black? Yeah, I do. actually, yeah, here. Okay. See, and, and the then, for, for the date. Yeah. The theme, if you could call one, um, is probably a scrapbook. A lot of people won't get the symbolism. Somebody's going to be looking at this. What is this going to mean to them? Um, it doesn't matter. We know. <laughs> <laughs> we don't fool around that he wasn't an angel. I mean, <laughs> you know, he was a real, honest to God, red blooded American. He liked to win. He liked to succeed, all those good American values, and he wasn't above changing the rules. When we have our barbecues and get-togethers, we always have games first. And it turns out we have climb rules. 
we just found out that it, they weren't really Klein rules. They were Peter Klein rules. <laughs> it would make it more exciting and more challenging, and also that he had a better chance to win. 65 quilt panels were made, each measured six feet by three feet. These panels would be exhibited in New York Central Park, Washington, D.C., and then throughout the country. The idea of creating something that has elements of that person to you, if you think about a headstone, right, and you write something, you've picked a very specific quote or labels for that person, so they were a mother, a sister, a friend, I think quilting has some of those same elements. the second oldest of nine children in an Irish family. First thing I wrote here is second of nine. I feel like that's the first thing anybody can say about her. She commuted four hours every day. You know, from Bucks County, Pennsylvania to Manhattan is not an that easy was, trip. That's a good day. Yeah, a good day would be four hours round trip. Four hours. And she did that because she wanted to live near Close her brothers and families. sisters. They all live in Pennsylvania, almost all of them. And um, she wanted to be as close to them as she could. So on the weekends, she could pop over and that was the most important thing to her was family. She got me doing things that I would have never done, that I always dreamed about doing. She just uh, liked to take adventures. We made a pact when we first started going out. She would teach me skiing and I would teach her golf. We wanted to include everybody in the family, and especially uh, Shelly. She created this baby blanket with all the significance of her son, Sandy's grandson. She got to see him being born in this picture here on the quilt. You can see that uh, she was holding him just a few minutes after he was born. That was really neat for her. She was so excited to be a grandmother, really thrilled. People need to replace, it's like a, a vacuum. They need to replace the destruction of the material with material. The quilts are really surrogates for people who aren't there anymore. Quilt really starts off when he was uh, a baby and moves down into when Paul and I first met and then when we had children. I'm glad that when you walk in and, and you see the quilt, that family does stand out. <laughs> he just couldn't wait to get home from work every day just to be with us. And just have fun, really have fun. Work was a necessary interruption. Exactly. <laughs> There's a picture in the quilt of Paul reading the newspaper, and that absolutely had to be a part of this because he read the New York Times from front to back every day. For a long time until the children came, he subscribed to Foreign Affairs magazine, and then he didn't have the time to read it. <laughs> <laughs> he was having too much fun. You can go underneath the table. Paul was the average age. And everything you read about them makes them sound like my son. Julia, could you show me what you did on the panel? How do you explain to young children that they'll never see their father again? And how about Daria? Do you have a picture on here? Can you reach it? Kids just know instinctively, before we do sometimes, that things are not right. Here she goes, okay. to that picture. That's yours. Ella really knew very shortly after it all happened. Everyone else 
thought that he would be coming back. I didn't think he would. It was just something I knew. It wasn't, no one needed to tell me. He was a real hands-on dad. He was around so much. He was around to help them with homework, to go and see their games. A lot of times, the relationship had to do with food, <laughs> which, was, which was really fun. And we, had, we all had a lot of fun. He loved cooking. He loved wine, nice wines. Yeah. Rachel did this wonderful drawing of a pig, which is a great big pink pig. We had this thing called pigs in a trough, where we'd be making fudge or something, and you, you know, you always, of course, have leftover fudge in the bowl, purposely. And so we'd all grab spoons, and he'd yell, pigs in a trough, and we'd all um, scrape the bowl clean. It was a very messy, messy way of eating, but they loved it. <laughs> we decided we'd do it all together, where we had no interruptions, and we just sat for about two hours, and we each did our own thing, and we went and got the quotes that we wanted. Ella actually um, copied some poppies from some table mats that we rather liked. We wanted to, as best we could, have this be a representation of so many different aspects of Ian, because there were so many aspects to Ian. He liked books and loved Shakespeare. He was a British citizen, but he loved America and was very happy to be living here. We didn't want to give it up almost. No. I mean, it was something that we could touch of that really had Ian for us. One of the hardest things was to meet parents who lost children on 9-11. Many of the victims were young, just beginning their lives. Although his family lived in New Jersey, Vincent had just moved into his own apartment in Manhattan. I had never seen his apartment because it was brand new. He lived on the fifth floor and no elevators. And I don't do steps very well, and I can't walk that well but I was determined that I was going to go. And we did go, and I did get up there. It was very hard. But in the true nature of Vincent, because Vincent was always neat and clean, walked into the apartment, and there was not a thing out of place. I was always proud of everything he did. I've always looked up to him. Vincent was an environmentalist. He liked everything, uh, clean water, save the animals. His favorite was save the whales. At Vincent's memorial service, I wrote a poem. At the end, he was soaring high on the wings of an eagle. We put the eagle with the flag because that's the USA. Never forget America. We're very proud of the quilt. To us, it represents Vincent. The world was filled with tears. We were grieving for people we never knew. People definitely grieve in different ways, but one thing that's really excruciating about grief is this feeling of isolation, that you are very alone, not just because you've lost someone important, but because you're feeling something so 
horrible, somehow no one else could touch it. But by being with others who are grieving over the same loss, that kind of support for not everyone, but for some people really is a comfort. There is something socially therapeutic about making a quilt, not just as an individual act of homage, but as a collective act of homage. You know, whether you're sitting down with your next door neighbors or family members, uh, or working with colleagues or total strangers. How do you feel? I want to look at this Positive. and not see sadness. This, I want it to be about Stevie's life. This is going to be folded and transported and taken right. down and All transported. Right. We're putting the name in the middle, the top or the bottom. Where are we going to start? Oh, maybe in a... Uh, I'm thinking yeah, that I think so. I think a group of quilters volunteered to make panels and they started with a panel for Lieutenant Stephen Bates, a fallen fireman they knew. Do you think it looks silly by itself? Because we didn't no, spell it out. No, no, no. With a period, Karen. Give me the period. Give me the period. period. Give me the period. Give me no. I think there is a physical connection with the name, the face, the tokens of personality or insignia of profession that are being chosen for these types of memorial panels. Stevie didn't leave any family. He had a wealth of friends. How this whole thing got started for me is when Stevie died, my son is 15, and he said to me, you know, Mom, who is going to remember Stevie Bates? These quilters also helped the Homer family. We didn't necessarily twist her arm to, but she did say if we can't find anybody else to sew it for us, then she would do it. And I guess we looked pitiful enough because... <laughs> <laughs> she volunteered. She told us about the quilt. She would help us, and she said, get pictures together. So Jermaine, my daughter Jermaine, my daughter Monique, my nephew Bobby and I, we went and bought the material. Then we had the pictures done, and she made this beautiful, beautiful quilt for us did a terrific job. In fact, she did everything. Karen and Dorothy, they did the boards, they did the sewing. Leroy is my baby brother. I was four when he was born. He always had a love for planes. When Leroy was 15, he started taking his flying lessons. That was his dream. The sky was his life. In 1995, he was hired by United Airlines. Very rarely did he ever fly out of Newark. And he just changed his trips for his baby so he would be home more often. This is Leroy at his last year at the Air Force Academy. And this is Leroy in flight training in Oklahoma. This is the picture of Leroy's wedding and this is his uh, memorial. project. And as time goes by, things get a little easier, but you need something to do to make the time go by. You've got to heal without your best friend, and that's very, very hard. One night when I was putting her to bed, my oldest one, Julia, said to me, she was crying and she was very angry with me, and we started to talk, and she said, you know what, Mommy, she said, you can just get yourself a new husband but we can't get a new daddy. Julia said yesterday I had a dad, and today I have a Mr. Nobody. And she didn't mention his name again till I think, Christmas, mm -hmm. when we were coming home from New York. Mm -hmm. And she started singing Deck the Halls. And I said, I didn't know you knew that, Carol. I said, where did you learn that? She said, Dad taught it to me. I just hoped that he wasn't in pain, that he wasn't too frightened. He wanted a child so badly, and he finally got a child. And he only had 10 months to be with her. I don't cry every day, but every so often I catch my breath because I realize I'll never see him again. 
was sudden, unexpected. People were young. Their lives were ended before their time. And because it was a violent act. So all of those things make it unusual in loss. And because the memory of this event is a flash memory, it's like a very traumatic, large scale, out of the normal human existence kind of trauma that all added together to make this, uh, I think, a particularly difficult loss for many people. I really don't feel he's gone. It's what we call the log cabin then pattern. It keeps going in a spiral, in a circle. And I wanted to express life is a circle. I was working on it and then thinking, I don't want to be doing this because as I, as I am marking the, uh, the letters to be embroidered, I think this isn't good enough. It's not straight enough. It's not what you deserve. I, I do want it to be out there, but at the same time, it's just, yeah, the feeling, the feeling is there, we're not doing as good a job. It's, it's simplistic, it's this, it's that. I mean, I've been going through that, too. And, and then thinking, too, if, if it's something we really like, if it's cool, then, gee, isn't it a shame we can't show it to him? Not having any children, he won't have anybody to tell his story. So this is a way to tell his story. I am very happy to have had this opportunity to do this. And I am looking forward to going and being in New York and seeing all the other panels and seeing what they're like and maybe meeting some of the other families that will be there. Quilt panels were donated to the National 9-11 Memorial Museum, where they will be preserved and available for continued viewing. The quilt panels honor those who died on September 11th. They will forever remain in our hearts.